Well, welcome everyone. The Physics and Astronomy Department is really thrilled to bring you this event. We're going to be showcasing some really cutting edge research being done by three members of our faculty, uh, or sorry, of our department, three women that are ranging in different stages of their career from a graduate student, a postdoctoral fellow, and a faculty member. Um, and they will be covering the three core areas of research in our department, namely astrophysics, condensed matter physics, and particle physics. Um, this is being brought to you by our Departmental Advisory Council. The Advisory Council consists of a group of alumni and other friends of the department who provide us with support and promote our activities to help us achieve our goals in terms of research and in terms of education. Towards the end of the event, you will hear from the chair of the Advisory Council, David Kupperman. Um, if anyone has any questions about the council, please feel free to contact either me or Serena Schreiber after the event. Just a, a little bit of um, logistics here. Uh, to make this go smoothly, we ask that you mute yourself during the talks um, and that we allow the speakers to talk uninterrupted. And then um, we will have a question and answer session immediately after the talk. And you can either just unmute yourself and ask your question, or you can type in the chat window. Um, and with uh, further ado, I'd like to get into the program then. So our first speaker is Professor Nadia Zakamska. Um, she's an astrophysicist. She has worked on an immense range of topics, both in observational astronomy and in theoretical astrophysics. She got her PhD in Princeton. Um, she then spent five years at the Institute for Advanced Study, first as a postdoctoral fellow and then as a long-term member. And then she held a Kavli Fellowship at Stanford and she joined us in 2011. So although Nadia has worked on, as I said, an incredible array of topics, she's probably best known for her work on supermassive black holes, maybe the most exotic denizens of the universe. And so she's going to highlight what makes supermassive black holes so intriguing and important We'll talk a bit about her contributions in that area. So let me turn it over to Nadia then. Thank you, Tim. I hope uh, everybody can see my screen now. Um, I'm going to be talking about um, supermassive black holes and their gusty influence on the birth of galaxies. Um, and before I dive into the topic, I would like uh, for you all to have this mental image of a galactic wind um, that is illustrated on the figures here. Um, this is a galaxy M82. It's an edge on disk galaxy. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. And on the left panel, um, this is what this galaxy appears in normal visible optical light that our eyes are sensitive to. And on the right panel, uh, you see the way this galaxy appears in the infrared, and you see this enormous uh, red halo glow of stuff that is actually dust particles being thrown out of this galaxy. And these dust particles are something called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Uh, and you're actually familiar with them, uh, even if you don't know them by name, because this is something that uh, comes out of your car's exhaust. Uh, they are stinky and uh, they're not good for you to breathe at all. And so uh, this galaxy here is doing some really thorough spring cleaning and getting rid of all this dust and stinky stuff uh, in this uh, really powerful large scale galactic wind. So um, this is just a picture of what I want, um, picture that I would like for you to carry in mind as we go forward. Um, this particular wind is uh, not the kind that I study. This wind here is, is uh, powered by the starburst in the nucleus of this galaxy. I'll be talking about supermassive black holes and their winds, uh, but uh, it's a nice visual um, to keep in mind. So, I'm sorry, uh, there we go. Um, I will um, say a few words about what kind of galaxies we encounter in the present day universe, uh, what kind of open questions we're thinking about um, in cosmology and galaxy formation. Um, then I will switch to talking about supermassive black holes and centers of galaxies. How do we know they exist? How can they do anything if they're black holes? Um, and then I will discuss or say a few words about the work that my group um, has been doing 
on the interplay between galaxies and their black holes. And again, I'm repeating the same image here that I've already shown you uh, of M82. And then above that, there is another uh, disk galaxy with the blue glow now showing a galactic wind. So another uh, illustration of uh, a galactic wind. Um, so today we are 13.8 billion years after the Big Bang. Um, and we have exquisite sky surveys, um, including Sloan Digital Sky Survey that has obtained not just images, but spectra of uh, over a million of galaxies. Um, nearby galaxies come in relatively distinct two types um, that are illustrated in these two images here. Massive galaxies and nearby universe are composed of billions to trillions of stars. Some galaxies have gas uh, from which new stars can form. And that type of galaxy is illustrated on the bottom. Uh, this is a face on disk galaxy. You see these uh, striking spiral arms. Uh, but most importantly, you see those blue blotches of light. And those are the locations where new massive blue stars are forming from uh, gas that's available in this galaxy for star formation. In contrast, the galaxy on the top has no gas. Uh, it is a, not a disk galaxy. It is a spheroidal galaxy or elliptical as we call them. It's a spheroidal um, stellar system composed of old stars, hence it's orange color. That's just the typical color of uh, old stars, stars that are many billion years old. Um, and, and it has no gas for new star formation. And so it's lacking uh, the blue blotches of uh, corresponding to new massive young stars. The gas and the stars in these galaxies are made out of normal matter, mostly hydrogen and helium with um, you know, a few percent of um, heavier elements mixed in. But galaxies are held together by gravity dominated by dark matter. Uh, and we'll talk extensively about this today. Um, there, are, um, there have been a slew of enormous successes in galaxy formation theory and in cosmology in the last 20, 30 years. And um, you have heard of um, several of these advances uh, because of course the overall geometry of the universe is now known to a few percent precision. This is called precision cosmology. And of course people in our department like Chuck Bennett and Adam Reese and others have made key contributions to the development of precision cosmology. Uh, something else we understand pretty well is how light propagates through space over these uh, vast distances, um, over the length scale of the entire universe. Um, this is an example image of a galaxy cluster, nearby galaxy cluster that is gravitationally lensing background galaxies that are stretched into these long, thin arcs. Um, and despite the enormous complexity of the system, we actually can model and calculate the propagation of light through the system very, very well. This is something we can do. Uh, we also know that galaxies are the luminous knots in the matter distribution in the universe that's largely dominated by the dark matter. Uh, we also can calculate the distribution of galaxies in space, uh, also known as clustering of galaxies. We understand that very well. And again, um, some of the members of our department, like Alex Zale and Brice Menard, have made important contributions um, in these areas. Okay, there are things we don't know very well. And this uh, million dollar question that the 800 pound gorilla is carrying that's been brushed under the rug in this whole previous discussion is what is this dark matter stuff uh, that I have been mentioning? And this is a fundamental and enduring astrophysical and particle physics uh, problem. And Melissa, who is uh, speaking right after me, will be uh, discussing this very question in detail. Uh, this is a question that now transcends several different research areas. Um, but there are also very important things we still don't understand about the behavior of normal matter in galaxies. And so uh, there are these additional questions uh, that are not even related to dark matter, that are just related to normal matter that uh, we need to resolve. 
So one such question is um, that basic galaxy formation theory uh, predicts way too many galaxies that are too blue. And this is illustrated here on this graph uh, on the right hand side. Uh, the data points with error bars are the observations and those are numbers of galaxies as a function of galaxy mass. So on the right hand side you have massive galaxies, on the left hand side you have um, small feigned galaxies. Um, the Milky Way mass happens to be right at around the knee or at the turnover of the function. And uh, what's really interesting is that there is a strong disagreement between those data points uh, with error bars that are the measurements and the prediction of the basic uh, galaxy formation theory that I'm highlighting here with a red line. So clearly there are too many, uh, the theory predicts too many low mass galaxies that are not observed and the theory predicts too many high mass galaxies that are not observed. And so these are also some of the fundamental uh, problems in galaxy formation that um, we are, uh, trying to solve and that my group has been working on solving. So we still need to improve the theory of galaxy formation on galactic scales. Um, so what is needed in order to solve this problem is we need to suppress galaxy formation. So um, actually, I'm not sure if I can go back one slide. There we go. So um, clearly, um, theoretically, uh, there is a lot of gas available to form galaxies, but somehow they don't form in reality. So what we need to do is we need to find what are the mechanisms that prevent this gas from uh, forming new stars. Uh, and the trick is to reheat the gas or blow it out of the galaxy altogether uh, to prevent stars from forming. So that's the connection to the galactic winds that I showed you. Uh, very early on in the talk. Things that explode uh, really help. Uh, for example, supernova explosions can uh, push gas out of the galaxy. Um, and um, here I'm showing a numerical simulation of a very first supernova in the universe. Um, such an object has not yet been observed, but people have calculated what it would look like. Um, so this is a numerical simulation, again, of a first supernova in a dwarf galaxy. Um, the blue uh, uh, light here shows the distribution of gas that follows the filamentary structure of the dark matter. In the center here, we have this proto-galaxy um, in the very early universe. And then when the supernova explodes, it blows uh, out this big bubble. So it literally throws the gas out of this little dwarf galaxy and it reheats everything. Um, so that's very helpful, but it turns out so when you do the necessary calculations that supernovae are not enough, um, especially for the, uh, to uh, understand the um, uh, most massive elliptical galaxies, the ones that don't have a lot of gas. Um, and so this is where the supermassive black holes come in. Um, black holes are a very hot topic. Um, 2017 Nobel Prize uh, was awarded for the detection of gravitational waves from the mergers of stellar mass black holes and the 2020 Nobel Prize was awarded for the discovery of the supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy. So um, black holes are very fashionable. Um, black holes are uh, extremely dense objects. If you were to squeeze somehow Earth, um, ma the mass of the Earth into the size of a grape, or if you were to squeeze the sun into the size of Manhattan Island, you would get a black hole. A black hole is an object where gravity is so strong that uh, nothing, even light, can escape. And as I said, in astronomy, we have two types of black holes. Um, we have black holes that are stellar remnants, whose mass is a few times the mass of the sun, uh, which are produced when massive stars explode as supernovae. And those are the ones that we see in LIGO uh, gravitational wave events. And we have supermassive black holes, um, the ones that are more than a million solar masses. Um, and uh, those live in centers of galaxies. It does appear that nearly every massive galaxy has one supermassive black hole in its center. It's a 
pretty amazing fact. It's a major discovery made over the last two decades by primarily using by the Hubble Space Telescope and now with more uh, modern instrumentation that can also be done from the ground. Um, uh, these images on the right are taken in our own galaxy, um, Milky Way. Uh, so you can see that the center of our galaxy is a very busy place with lots and lots of stars. And then we zoom in onto the very central uh, white rectangle. And then if we observe the position of stars over time, uh, then we see uh, that these stars move seemingly around a common center of gravity. And we can use the laws of physics to calculate the mass of this object that we otherwise don't observe. And it turns out to be 3 million solar masses. The movie that I'm showing you is from the UCLA um, group led by Andrea Guess, who just uh, um, within the last few weeks received um, the Nobel Prize for this work. So in our own galaxy, we see, we find the supermassive black hole by its effect on the surrounding stars. Um, many of you have probably seen this picture from the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration that came out last year. Um, this is a nearby galaxy M87, uh, where we can see a little bit of emission from some of the stuff that's being eaten by the black hole. Uh, and that is uh, being, this image is being strongly gravitationally lensed by the black hole itself so that we can see this black hole shadow. Um, in other galaxies, the um, nucleus of the galaxy and the black hole are too far and too small on the sky for us to be able to um, take such precision measurements. Um, so we know that black holes exist in those galaxies by looking at the sums of all stellar motions in these galaxies. But basically, anytime you look in the nucleus of a galaxy, you find a supermassive black hole there, uh, with the exception of um, the smallest, um, most diffuse dwarf galaxies. So what can they do? Uh, most of the time, they just sit passively in the center of the galaxy, exerting gravity on the surrounding stars. And that is what we saw in that movie uh, showing the stellar orbits around um, Sagittarius A star. And true to their name, they cannot make anything. Once the something falls in, it cannot get out, including light. However, as the matter is falling into the black hole, it can be very vocal. Um, this is an illustration of, of uh, something called an accretion disk around a black hole that's produced when stuff is trying to get into the black hole. And it turns out that um, the matter in its final stages of being swallowed by the black hole can produce copious amounts of radiation. So here we have now a situation where uh, in the very center of the galaxy, you can have this extremely powerful source of radiation. Those are called quasars. Um, now this radiation can push on the surrounding matter uh, and uh, produce these galactic winds. Again, bearing in mind the picture that I showed you in the very beginning. And this is the process that I've been studying in my group and I, um, have had a very uh, large group uh, studying very various aspects of this problem for many years. So I'm not gonna go into the details of uh, all of these observations. I'm just gonna give you three highlights very quickly. Um, so our group um, discovered black hole driven galactic winds. We use um, uh, various methods of modern observational astronomy and the sort of name of the game these days is that we basically use observations at every frequency of the electromagnetic spectrum to probe different aspects uh, of this problem and the physical conditions, different types of galaxies, different types of winds. Uh, we've used many, many different telescopes on the ground and in space, Hubble, VLT, Atacama Cosmology Telescope. But it all started with a classical observing run on Gemini um, right before I came to Hopkins, actually. Um, uh, so I, I physically went there, which is not something we do um, very much these days. Um, so I was on the mountain taking data in real time. And those are some of the pictures of the mountain top on Mauna Kea that I took on those trip, uh, on that trip. So it's a very beautiful location. You see these uh, 
classical uh, volcanic uh, volcanic tops with the tops blown off um, and with all the telescopes on Mauna Kea. Um, okay, so um, just a quick uh, foray into what kind of data we actually get. Um, so this top image is uh, an illustration of the data that I obtained during that run on the Gemini telescope. Uh, what we see in these images is gas at about 20,000 degrees. Unlike stars, gas does not produce a lot of emissions, so we have to use spe special techniques to uh, measure this emission. Um, and so you see these maps of gas that I have made in the, on the right-hand side in the top. Um, and uh, on the bottom, I have a Hubble Space Telescope image of the same galaxy to scale. And so one thing that you can see immediately is that the galaxy is pretty small. It's a very distant galaxy, which is why it appears small on the sky. So you can see that the wind, uh, the extent of the gas um, is much, much larger than the galaxy itself. And we can measure the extent, the amount of gas. We can measure the velocities of the gas. Uh, we can confirm that this is a giant galactic scale wind. Uh, being produced by this uh, very powerful, very powerfully radiating black hole uh, or accretion disk around the black hole in the center of this galaxy. Um, the joint analysis of the Gemini data and of the Hubble data was actually performed by Domenico Lozalek, who was an Barry Mac postdoctoral fellow um, in my group in the department, and she's now a faculty member, a group leader um, with a very fancy um, uh, fellowship at the University of Heidelberg. Um, so this is one example type of uh, data that we use. Um, another example is a completely different type of observation at millimeter, observa at millimeter wavelengths, um, radio waves. Uh, we have, um, we can detect extremely hot giant bubbles of gas, which are produced when the winds um, shock heat the uh, galactic medium. And this was work done by Kirsten Hole, who was a graduate student in my group and is now a Schmidt and SMA postdoctoral fellow at Harvard. Um, so just a couple of examples of our work in this area, and we have many others. Um, but I'll um, summarize. So. Um, galaxies are luminous knots of the cosmic web, which is largely composed of dark matter, and Melissa is going to tell you a lot more about that. Massive galaxies contain supermassive black holes in their centers. Um, as matter falls into the black hole, the released energy can clear the gas from the galaxy, and that turns out to be a major effect in galaxy formation that uh, helps explain uh, many of the long-standing puzzles that we have seen in cosmology and galaxy formation. And I think I'll stop here and I might be way out of time. <laughs> Thank you, Nadia. So I think let's just try an experiment. If you have questions to ask, don't be shy, just unmute yourself and ask Nadia. If you are shy, you can also try using the chat box and type in your question and I can read it. Are, I guess one question, are there any uh, observational equipment or telescopes that are in the, the pipeline to, to be deployed in the next few years that can be helpful in, in your research or, or, or is the, are the existing kind of equipment out there sufficient for what you're trying to achieve? Oh my goodness. <laughs> well, so, okay. <laughs> um, I am personally an opportunist um, I uh, craft my entire research program around uh, what is the next interesting technological development um, in the field. And so I constantly, constantly think about new facilities and new telescopes and new things coming online. So just last week, we had a major deadline in our field for the James Webb Space Telescope. It hasn't launched yet. Uh, but they have already solicited uh, proposals for the first year of observations. And my group wrote nine proposals and we drove ourselves mad <laughs> um, doing that. But um, we're using um, an enormous uh, range of facilities um, uh, 
ongoing and thinking about things that are coming online in the next few years. So I personally don't um, build instrumentation. I'm an opportunist who uses the, the instruments built by other people, but I have collaborated with um, Toby Merritt, who uh, is building class and who was instrumental in making Atacama Cosmology Telescope happen. And so we have taken advantage of ACT data for um, some of these projects that I have mentioned here. Hi, this is Shane Byrne here. Sorry, I had technological difficulties. So you don't see my name on the advisory council. Um, my information might be old here, but I, but I, as I recall, the smallest a black hole, the black hole's mass could be, was roughly two solar masses. That information is probably at least twenty-five years old. Uh, what is what? What do we know today about what's the smallest a black hole's mass could be? Right. This is a fantastic question. So. Um... Uh, and this is a subject of very intense research, especially relevant for uh, LIGO. So LIGO gravitational wave uh, detectors, as you have heard, so this LIGO um, received a uh, Nobel Prize in 2017, or rather three physicists received the Nobel Prize who had designed LIGO. Uh, LIGO, uh, because of various issues related to how it operates, is not sensitive to the supermassive black holes that I've talked about here, but is rather sensitive, uh, but is sensitive to stellar mass black holes that you're asking about. And so um, uh, we know of stellar mass black holes from two different channels. One is from LIGO. But one is actually we have observations of objects in our own galaxy. We know of a few hundred um, uh, stellar mass black hole candidates in our own galaxy. And um, the typical lowest masses on those objects are about um, between five and 10 solar masses with the most typical masses for them being between 10 and 15. Now, what's really interesting and new as of uh, just a couple of years ago is that LIGO detected for the first time a merger of two neutron stars. And two neutron stars, each one has um, a mass of 1.4 solar masses. So when they merge, what is not known is what is that object. It is just at that really interesting regime of the borderline uh, possible mass uh, close to the maximal mass of the neutron star, but could be a black hole. And so what we don't, we do know that such objects exist at about three solar masses. What we don't know yet is whether it, those are going to be neutron stars and black holes. So this is a very interesting question and I'm sure <laughs> people are writing hundreds of papers about uh, about what they are and how to determine what they are. Okay, I'm gonna read a question from Don Richardson. It wants to know whether the size of the galaxy correlates with the size of the central black hole. Very good question. So this is again, so one of the uh, most major uh, discoveries by Hubble and I took out some of those slides. I don't think I have them here. Yeah, I, I took it out. Uh, but yes, the answer is yes. In the local universe, bigger galaxies tend to have bigger, or rather, okay, the appropriate uh, terminology is more the masses correlate. So the mass of the galaxy correlates with the mass of the black hole, and some other properties of the host galaxy correlate with the mass of the black hole. So, um, um, another thing I haven't discussed is how um, these winds that I have been talking about actually produce this correlation. And the answer is that um, theoretical models predict uh, or rather can model how these galactic winds um, can actually establish this correlation. So for us, it's a major observation that we're also trying to reproduce when we think about black holes and galaxy formation. Okay, thank you, Nadia. Um, I'm sure we could go on with more questions, but I'm afraid we're going to have to move on to the next speaker. But I, I know Nadia would be happy to answer emails or, you know, if there are things you want to follow up with her, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. So um, we're going to stay on the theme of black holes and dark matter. 
Uh, this is a talk being given by a graduate student, Melissa Donovan. Melissa uh, was an undergraduate and also received her master's degree in math and physics at the University of Pennsylvania and joined us as a graduate student uh, not that long ago. And it, I wanted to particularly highlight that she was awarded the prestigious William Gardner Fellowship. And this is made possible by the generous support from our advisory council member, member Bill Gardner. He is working with Professor Mark Hamienkowski in cosmology and in particular, exploring exotic ideas for the possibility of the nature of dark matter. And that's what she's gonna be talking about. Melissa? All right, hello. Uh, so as Tim said, uh, my research has recently been focusing on uh, dark matter, specifically magnetic black holes as dark matter. And I'll elaborate on this uh, in the presentation. But really, uh, what I want to talk about is how to find something <clears throat> when you don't know what you're looking for. And this is very central to my field and my research. The field that I study is called cosmology, which is uh, so attempting to understand uh, the universe, uh, very broad questions about it, uh, how it formed, how it evolves, and what it's made of today. This is made a bit more difficult because we only have one universe to work with, it's massive and we're living inside of it. So we rely on telescopes such as the Hubble Space Telescope, or very large detectors. Uh, this is Super K in uh, Japan, it's a neutrino detector, uh, to observe the universe around us. To make sense of these observations, we often rely on phenomenology, uh, which is a field that I work in that tries to connect theory with observable phenomena. So sometimes I will consider an observation that's unexpected or abnormal for some reason and try to find theories that could describe what's happening. Other times I'll consider a theory, maybe my own, maybe someone else's, and try to describe what we'd be able to observe in our universe if this theory were true. And uh, one central question of cosmology that I've been using this for is dark matter. So ever since dark matter was confirmed to exist by Vera Rubin 50 years ago, uh, it has been a, a question we've sort of all been thinking about. Now, uh, Vera Rubin discovered or confirmed dark matter uh, based on observing how stars move about the center of a galaxy. What she saw is that stars uh, at the outside of the galaxy are moving around much too quickly to be held in place by the amount of mass that you could see just from looking at the stars and the gas, everything that was bright. What she concluded was that you'd actually need five times more matter, more mass than what you can see uh, in order to hold these galaxies together and prevent them from flying apart. We can't see this mass and so it's called dark matter. Uh, over the years, a lot of evidence has piled up uh, to you know, verify that something uh, that we call dark matter must be out there. Uh, what you're looking at here is a picture of the bullet cluster. This is two clusters of galaxies that have collided together. The area highlighted in pink is ordinary matter. It got very hot and it got slowed down in the collision. And this is what would happen if ordinary matter, stuff made of you or me or really anything you've ever encountered uh, was in a collision like this. In the purple, that's dark matter, something that did not heat up in the collision, but we can see that most of the mass from the two clusters of galaxies is actually residing in the purple region. So there's something that's not emitting light uh, that has a lot of the mass that we keep seeing again and again. So after 50 years of thinking about dark matter, uh, there are a few things that we understand about it. We know that there is five times more dark matter in the universe than ordinary matter. We know that it's holding galaxies together, it's holding clusters of galaxies together. So it's, it's very important for even stars to be able to form. Um, it interacts with us through gravity, but it's not interacting with us particularly through light. We can't see it. It's also important that it's long lasting. Uh, we have evidence that dark matter exists today, but we also have evidence that dark matter existed in the universe 13 billion years ago. So it has to be able to survive that amount of time. 
Over here is a computer simulation of how dark matter might be distributed in the universe. Uh, these bright spots here are uh, regions where clusters of galaxies might congregate. So this is a, a very large scale map. And just to give you perspective on how much this uh, attempt to understand dark matter has dominated the field, I provided this sort of non-exhaustive list of different telescopes, detectors, experiments that have been designed to try to detect or understand dark matter. And these are all experiments that would take take years to run and require many like teams of scientists working together uh, to man. You might be wondering, how do you design an experiment to look for dark matter? You don't even we don't even know what we're looking for. Well, the way we go about this is by starting with a reasonable guess. I'll get into what makes a reasonable guess on the next slide. But once you have something that you think could be dark matter, we want to take time to understand how this new candidate could behave. Uh, there's two reasons for this. One, we want to make sure that if this candidate made up all of the dark matter in the universe, um, it would not contradict what we already see and understand about the universe around us. And then two, if it passes that check, then we want to know how it behaves so we can find ways to observe it. Once we know how to observe it, you can build a detector or an experiment to prove it exists, and then you find dark matter, and then you win the Nobel Prize. Now, unfortunately, nobody's made it past step three just yet. My work focuses on steps one and two, finding things that could be good candidates for dark matter, and then understanding how they behave and how we can look for them. And so to do this, I first need to know what makes a good dark matter candidate. Uh, so one, it should behave like dark matter. So what this means is it should not emit light. Uh, so flashlights are bad dark matter candidates. It should also be long lasting. It has to exist six, uh, 13 million years ago and today. So dark, uh, so Batman, not a good dark matter candidate. I mean, he's dark, but he's not 13 billion years old. Um, a good dark matter candidate is actually black holes, uh, heavy black holes, the sometimes the type that Nadia was describing, uh, because they're dark, they're heavy, and they can last a very long time. The other things we like to look for when we're thinking about a uh, new dark matter candidate is something that can answer more than one open question in physics. That makes a theory more compelling. Uh, we also want something that requires us to minimally change uh, the theoretical framework we already have uh, for physics, just because that, that makes a theory much more difficult to work with. And so, as I said, black holes are uh, a good dark matter candidate. It's a region from which nothing can escape. What you might not be familiar with about them is that they decay over time, they shrink. Now, the lighter a black hole is, the smaller it is, the more quickly it decays. So when we think about solar mass black holes or supermassive black holes, they have lifetimes much, much longer than the age of the universe. We don't really have to worry about those decaying. But when we think about much smaller black holes, uh, maybe a Melissa-sized black hole, well, those can decay away in nanoseconds. So those aren't good dark matter candidates. Which brings me to my research on magnetic black holes. These are black holes with very, very large magnetic charges. Now what the magnetic charge does is it prevents the black hole from decaying. So where I couldn't ever consider a Melissa-sized neutral black hole, I could think about a Melissa-sized magnetic black hole. That's something that could survive the lifetime of the universe and could maybe be dark matter. They're good for this because it's hard to get rid of their magnetic charge and because they're actually allowed within our current framework of physics. General relativity allows black holes to have magnetic charge and theorists have been thinking about magnetic charges in the universe since the 1970s, so it's, it's well established. And so I will take my magnetic black holes through the same process we want to take any uh, dark matter candidate through. I want to first ask, does it behave like dark matter? It does. They're long-lived, they interact via gravity, they don't interact with light, so 
that is taken care of. Next, can they solve more than one open physics question? Maybe. Um, they can generate large magnetic fields, and this can perhaps help with uh, generating magnetic fields in galaxies, which is currently uh, an open question. Uh, they can also help trigger supernovae. Uh, we sort of know supernovae, we see them, but there is some uncertainty about what exactly sets them off. And these can help with that process, but I'll explain that in a little. And then finally, does it require us to minimally change uh, physics to accommodate the candidate? And that's also true. Uh, uh, our current framework of physics more or less already allows magnetic black holes to exist. So now that I have my dark matter candidate, I want to ask what would happen if, in this case, magnetic black holes composed all of the dark matter? Well, my research has found that there are three different phenomena that conflict with observations that we have of the universe. The first is that if black holes were all the magnetic dark matter, or if magnetic black holes were all of the dark matter, then uh, they would produce a lot of radiation, uh, which we'd be able to see. Second, uh, magnetic black holes can cause white dwarfs to explode into supernova explosions. So this is something else that we would see that uh, we don't exactly see in the way that it would happen if they were all of the dark matter. And then finally, uh, magnetic black holes can cause gas in the Milky Way to overheat, and this also will contradict uh, observations that we have. So I'm going to elaborate on each of these. Now, magnetic black holes uh, can come in positive or negative charges, and they can be attracted to their opposite charge uh, partner, form bound pairs, and over time these opposite charge magnetic black holes uh, can merge and collide and become one neutral black hole. Now, as I had said earlier, uh, a small magnetic black hole, those are long lived. A small neutral black hole is not. So what would be left after this collision would decay rapidly and release a lot of energy uh, as radiation that we'd be able to see. Now, if magnetic black holes were all of, of the dark matter, then they would produce more radiation than we observe in the universe today. So this is our first contradiction. The next comes from white dwarves. So white dwarves are just uh, what's left over when a star dies. Um, they're very dense when, and they're very good at catching magnetic black holes. So if a magnetic black hole were to fall into a white dwarf, they'd get trapped inside and sink to the bottom. In the bottom, they could pair up with another opposite charge magnetic black hole, uh, annihilate, and again form a neutral black hole. This decays quickly, and the amount of energy it releases is actually enough to cause the white dwarf to explode in the supernova. Uh, what this means is that we would observe, if this were true, that white dwarfs don't last very long. Uh, they all might explode within a billion years because they just keep accumulating magnetic black holes. But this contradicts what we see because we know that there are white, old white dwarfs out in the universe. Uh, the final phenomena that I found uh, that would be caused by magnetic black holes has to do with uh, gas in the Milky Way. So magnetic black holes, uh, there's friction between them and gas in the Milky Way. And this causes the gas to heat up. So we observe warm gases in the Milky Way, but if there were too many black holes, warm magnetic black holes pr present, then this warm gas would heat up so much that it would no longer behave as warm gas. It would become something different, hot gas. So this also contradicts our observations because we observe warm gas clouds in the Milky Way. We know that they exist. So bearing in mind all of these phenomena that would happen if magnetic black holes made up all of the dark matter, and comparing them to what we actually observe in the universe, there's a clear answer to the question of, can magnetic black holes be dark matter? No. But we've now crossed a candidate off the list of potential dark matter candidates, and we're left with a better understanding of an interesting ex an exotic object. 
like I said, black holes are magnetic black holes are still allowed to exist. So even if we can't have so many to be the dark matter, we can still have smaller amounts. <clears throat> we can have amounts that might be relevant to seeding galactic magnetic fields, or perhaps that can play some role in triggering supernovae. So that's uh, the topic of my research, but I hope you also now better understand the way we approach problems in my field. That's, that's all I had to say. Thank okay. you, Melissa. I was just <laughs> unmuting myself. So again, if anyone has any questions, just pipe up or you can <clears throat> the question in the chat window. We have time for a couple questions. Oh, Elisa, uh, hi. Um, hi. I have a question about uh, Dama experiment. So a few years ago, there there were some there was some news about uh, some signal in Dama experiment in Italy, which mm -hmm. uh, which uh, hasn't been confirmed by other ground based detectors. Uh, is there any update on that? Um, I mean, I would say last I had heard about Dama, I think, or at least the general consensus within the community is that there's something <sighs> wrong or there's some problem with the experiment itself, just because, as you pointed out, uh, no one has been able to reproduce uh, the signal that they saw. Um, but that's sort of, I think, the, the extent to which I hear about Dama these days. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Shane Byrne here again. Um, how much do we know about whether or not the level of dark matter has changed over time? And does that inform your you know, search as to what it might be? So that's an interesting question. Um, I do think we have a bit of wiggle room around uh, exactly how much dark matter has to be present at different points in the history of the universe. Um, what actually becomes more constraining is that that dark matter, if we, you know, if it disappears, has to become something else. And perhaps the something else that it becomes can introduce problems. So if the dark matter decays, into radiation, um, then cosmology is very sensitive to when that radiation is uh, being injected into the universe. So if it happens early, uh, that might not be allowed because that might change the way the cosmic microwave background looks. But if it's a bit later, you might be able to get away with it. Um, so that's going to depend on sort of the specific model you're working with. But I'd say in general, you can have you can probably have dark matter that changes form at least somewhat. Okay, I'm gonna, uh, one more question in the chat window. This is from Jeremy Smith. Um, and basically Jeremy is asking whether the gravitational wave data could have a signal in it that would indicate whether black holes are magnetic. Um, no, I don't think they should. Uh, so when black holes are, let's say merging, that's when you would see a gravitational wave signal and they would have an electromagnetic signal at the same time. Uh, but these are sort of two more or less independent signals. Um, and I don't, yeah, I, I don't think the magnetism of the black hole changes the way that they spin down. Uh, well, it speeds it up a bit because it has another way of losing energy, but I don't believe it changes. Oh, actually, I guess now that I think of it, maybe. Um, if two magnetic black holes were to merge, uh, then it, the whole process would happen more quickly because it's radiating both electromagnetically and gravitationally. So you may actually be able to observe it in that way because the spin down happens faster. Okay, great. Yeah, again, I'm, I'm sure we could go on with more questions, um, but as the MC, I have to move things along. Um, thank you, Melissa. Thank you. And our third speaker is Yishu Wang, who is a postdoc in the Institute for Quantum Matter here at Hopkins. Um, she's an experimental condensed matter physicist who received her PhD in physics 
from Caltech in 2018 and then joined the department. Um, issue specialty is looking at correlated electron systems and in her talk she's going to, I think one of the really fascinating things to me is how quantum mechanical effects that we normally think of as only being observable and atoms can actually manifest themselves in macroscopic ways in some exotic condensed matter systems. And this is an area of a lot of focus of the IQM and of Nisha's work. So are you sure? Hi, thanks. Uh, I'm sharing my screen. Um, Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for the introduction from Tim. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here today to talk about some research that we can as metaphysicists are, uh, are pursuing, which is at very different scales of space, time, and energy with what Nadia and Melissa were presenting. Um, so basically, I'm going to talk about solids, which actually compact number of electrons of 10 to the 17th to 20th order uh, on the millimeter cube scale. Um, and this sounds like to be quite messy, uh, but remarkably, this seemingly messy ensemble could demonstrate some really neat collective behavior, which can be quantum mechanically non-trivial. And this we so-called uh, emergent phenomenon uh, can produce a lot of quantum uh, demonstration of quantum mechanics such as quantum entanglement, and they actually provide, provide new promises to realize quantum computation, quantum information on solid state based platforms. And in this talk, I will first introduce some general principles of quantum mechanics to bridge over from the single particle physics to many body physics. And then I will talk about the proof of entanglement in solid state platform, but in a non interacting systems. And then I will introduce the emergent entanglement in many body interactions with a recent progress that uh, involved in my own research where we attack this topic in a classical model system. So one really amazing thing about quantum mechanics that it could puzzle physicists in the same way that it puzzles non-physicists, um, if not more. <laughs> so uh, as this famous quote from Niels Bohr goes, anyone who's not shocked by quantum theory has not understood it. But fortunately, we have a very cute and a famous messenger for quantum mechanics, which is this wanted cat that could be simultaneous dead and alive. And on the other hand, there is a common, any common misunderstanding of quantum mechanics always starts with if I flip a coin. So what's the difference between this cat and flipping a coin? Okay, so my ignorance of whether this coin to be zero or one is actually because I didn't reprobe some information that in principle that I can get. For example, if I really know precisely the state of this cone when I catch it, I should be able to know whether it should be one or zero. But however, for this cat, quantum mechanic explains that there's no way I can know whether it's zero or one because it's, super, super, it's a superposition of zero and one and it is only going to be collapsed at the moment that I measure. Of course, it's very counterintuitive Counterintuitive. How do I know if I don't matter it? So let's temporarily just accept this kind of interpretation, and we will immediately know that this system can contain very rich information, because first of all, it will preserve, it will lose no information, it will not lose any information about zero or one, and it process this information until you make the final probe. And for the same reason, the information is also secured because any attempts to pick it will be recorded and we will change it so it's secured. And most importantly, the information that it can contain actually scale exponentially with the number of systems that get involved. Of course, the systems has to be have a coherent state, which is quantum entanglement. So, um, but to make this all happen and to justify that superposition is really the way how quantum mechanics behaves, we actually need one state of matter, which is quantum entanglement. And this is what I'm going to talk about. Um, so entanglement is actually the key to test and to use quantum mechanics, but it's by itself is also a paradox. Uh, to really distinguish the two scenarios of superposition and a simple problem of probability distribution, Bell has proposed this mechanism to test it, is that if we send this state 
to independent tests of A, B, and C, and then we can record it numerously, like we draw this repetitively and we record result of pass or fail, which are nominated by A, B, C, and A bar, B bar, C bar. Bell proved that if it's a simple probability problem and there's no superposition, we will always have this inequality to be validated. And uh, this basically means that for experimentalists, we just need to verify that Bell's inequality is validated if quantum to support that quantum mechanics is, um, is good. However, if we look close to this inequality, we will see that the probability is a, asks for the simultaneous test for A and B, B and C and A and C. But how can we really send a single quantum state simultaneous to two different tests? And the answer is entangled state. So imagine that we have two identical quantum systems and each of them could be either zero or one. And then for some reason at the initial condition, there is some requirement for this A and B to preserve some conservation law. For example, they have to have the total momentum to be zero, our total angular momentum to be zero. And we will know that they will, the state of these two systems will be connected forever if there's no disturbance from the environment. And so in, in that sense, we will know that if we probe A to be zero, we will know that B will be zero or the other way around. And by preparing this kind of state of quantum entanglement, we can now send this A and B, we set them and send them independently to different tests and probe the, and run this test simultaneously so that we will be ready to check Bell's inequality. And, uh, but however, in a real measurement, to make sure that these two quantum systems are not cross-talking and the measurement are independent, Sometimes it requires the separation of A and B to be like long distance to be meters or kilometers. And at this scale, the instantaneous response of B to an action at A is going to maybe exceed the speed of light. And this is so called as the spooky action at a distance by Albert Einstein, who therefore argued that quantum mechanics is by no way complete. So this paradox is still at the theoretical front of quantum mechanics, which is certainly not a topic of, of this talk, but I would really be excited to show you that this state of quantum entanglement really has been observed experimentally and the Bell's inequality has been verified to be violated in a solid state system. So I'll start with non-interacting particles. Basically that means that quantum mechanics is only for single particles and we don't consider particle-particle interaction. And there are a lot of beautiful advanced experiments in photons and atomic physics. But here I want to talk about is a solid state realization of this such system. And that is, not, that is called color center, like nitrogen vaccine center in diamonds. And so by itself it's a quantum defect, but it's also a two level system that the electron spin can be pointing up and pointing down. And this energy level can be tuned by microwave and the spin state can be read out by optical fluorescence. And what's most remarkable in this system is that it has a spin sensitive photo emission, which means the spin up has to be corresponding to a photo number one and spin down has to be a photo number zero. And this provides a way that we can probe the photon state in order to know the spin state. And then simultaneously we probe the spin state, we'll know if they really fulfill the entanglement. So the way is that we have two nitrogen vacuum centers that are separated in two systems. And they emit photons and we send the photons to the third station that pass the beam splitter. And detectors behind the beam splitter cannot distinguish the photons they accept is from any of this, uh, which of these two emit centers. But by detecting photon states, we will know that click, this is entangled state. And now immediately we'll trigger a single shot readout of the spin state and we detect electron spins and niche. And at the end of the day, you can see the result histogram that record the measurement of the spin state, this one and this one, they collectively, they will create this kind of distribution probability that distinct different states, which means that they are, in, they are really quantum entangled. And what's amazing is that but you, this kind of like preparation of entanglement has been applied to really large scale experiment that to verify that Bell inequality can be violated. And the, rest, the, the way is that to place the two MV centers that are separated by one, more than one kilometer. And then we detect photons at 
about the midway station. And then uh, once it's triggered, we can probe the spin state. And at the end of the day, we can see that the Bell's inequality is well violated within the experimental error bar. So this, this really neat demonstration really verifies that quantum mechanics can work non-locally. And this demonstration certainly pro provides tremendous hope for realizing quantum computation and quantum teleportation using these dial state-based systems. But as we notice that it takes advantage of single particle quantum mechanics, which meanwhile means that it, it's fragile and it's, it's not resisting any perturbation. And to make it more robust, a lot of a lot of efforts are made towards this direction, but here I want to bring your attention to a totally different solid state design mechanism, which is from the many body interactions. So any emergent entanglement from these systems will be protected by numerous particles around it. And so that is going to be more stable. But I have to admit that the technical front of the solid state platforms is less advanced than the other platform, but it raises a lot of hope for the future. And the most well-established uh, demonstration of this non-local feature in manual systems is called fractional quantum Hall state. And now let me remind you about what is Hall effect. For any electron systems, if we pass current and there's uh, in the presence of a magnetic field, we will expect to see electrons uh, undergo a, a Lorentz force and then it could rotate. And then we'll be able to uh, measure the voltage and this voltage is proportional to the uh, charge carried by these carriers. And what's measured in experiment in some two-dimensional electron gas is that apparently the elementary charge carried by whatever particles in the system is not really elementary, and it's a fractional number of the elementary. And it was later understood as that when the electrons are very strongly interacting with each other in the presence of very strong magnetic field, and they are rendered as if that they only carry fractional charge, but they are not interacting. This basically means that strongly interact electrons that carry elementary charge is equivalent to a picture that they're not interacting, but they only carry fractional charge. And this certainly means that in this system, not a part of electrons can be described, but you have to involve all the electrons to really describe what you observed. And that's really amazing. It means that numerous electrons are behave as, as one entity. So this discovery was awarded the Nobel Prize in physics in 1998. And we know that electrons not only have charge, but also have spin. So a spin equivalent, a spin counterpart for this fractional quantum house state is called quantum spin liquids. And this is the focus of the research in our group that we have been uh, heavily working on. And experimentally, the state of quantum spin liquids have not been verified, but the idea is like this. So the spins can pair short range, but this pairing is actually dynamic, which means that seemingly these two are paired and these two are paired, but it's equivalent. And you cannot distinguish if it's really like this two are pairing and this two are pairing. And so this fluctuation can persist down to absolute zero temperature. And this basically means that you can never distinguish any spin pairs, but you have to regard all the spins as a whole and you only know that this pairing are all possible. And what's amazing here is that if I break a pairing between one pair, and then there are two defects here. And these defects are called, we, we explain that as excited particles, but however, if I now pair this defect with this one and break this one, that's an equal energy state, which means that I can move this defect to here without causing any energy. And at the, at the end of the day, I'm allowed to move these defects that are actually elementary excitations because they have to be created as a pair, but they can eventually become free. And this is called fractionalization because it represents that some elementary excitations now can be separated and they're separated free and indistinguishably. So this fractionalization, as I said, quantum spin liquids have not been experimentally verified, but the spin fractionalization can exist and can be demonstrated. Uh, and this example of a system that I'm recently working on, which is magnetic monopoles in the spin ice. So here we have this lattice that has this corner sharing tetrahedral and spins are going to reset on these vertices and they're allowed to be either pointing towards the center or against the center, which are referred to as in and out state. 
And the lowest energy state uh, here is actually two out of the four spins on the tetrahedral has to be in and the other two to be out. And immediately we notice that there are actually six different configurations that can satisfy this, this principle. And that means that all the elect all the tetrahedral will have like a lot of degeneracy and there's no way you can form a long range periodicity and it has to be a short range state and with a lot of degeneracy. And the short range state can be directly probed by neutron scattering, which our group is mainly used to experiment probe magnetism, because as a charged neutral neutron, it carries a spin one degree freedom that allows it to interact with magnetism. And this really beautiful diffusive patterns uh, actually signifies the short range correlations between these spins. And what's amazing about spin as ground state is that although the ground state is two in, two out, but by flipping a spin locally, I can create a defect. This is exactly as what I described just now for the quantum spin liquid, that you create a local pile of defects, but you can separate them without costing more energy. And so now, and what's amazing here is that mathematically, these defects are mapped as a magnetic monopoles, which are not allowed to exist in the vacuum. So this demonstrates the fractionalization process from a spin dipole to a magnetic monopole. And as we know here that the magnetic monopoles are the only dynamic entity at low temperature. However, because to create monopoles, you need energy and the thermal activation is really rare at low energy, at, at low temperature, which means that the time to achieve magnetic equilibrium is going to take super long low temperature. And that is how we measure the magnetic monopoles. What we do is that we want to see the time dependent feature of neutron scattering and that probe the magnetic monopole uh, motion. And so we turn the magnetic field periodically on and off and while probing with neutrons. And what we can see here is that we can see the onset of the coherent neutron scattering. And this onset process is even visible at a time scale of second. But consider that in kinetic matter physics, the relative time scale is always 10 to the minus 15 to 10 to the minus 12 second. But this can be really rich second, which means that the monopole excitation is really, really rare at low temperature. And if you look at the temperature dependence, we can see that at 1.3 Kelvin, this this intensity versus time, versus time plot signifies a characteristic time scale of millisecond, but at 0.6 Kelvin, it gives a time scale of 10 to the fourth second. The spanning over seven out of time scale is equivalent to from one second to one year, and that only is like 0.5 Kelvin difference in temperature. And complementary, if I approve this time dependent signature in the frequency domain, I can see that at high temperature, there are actually two independent relaxation modes. And that signifies that along with temperature at low temperature end, we have the magnetic monopoles. In the high temperature end, this is contributed by spin depots. And in between, there's a nice crossover, which means that as you cool to lower and lower temperature, the correlation effects get more and more pronounced. And then you observe this spin fra fraction fractionalization process from spins to magnetic monopoles. And that is due to the many body correlations. So I have introduced that this spin fractionalization is preserved, but because of the really long time scale, this is not really reaching the quantum coherent level. But it really sheds light on the material designs in the future. So ultimately, our goal is to realize the quantum entanglement in these many body systems that can create particles that can be really used for quantum computing, but there's a really long way ahead. So 100 years after quantum mechanics has been discovered, has been established, there's still a lot of mysteries to be solved, um, but it never fails to amaze us and never stops offering more opportunities for the future. So that is my talk. And uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you, Yushu. Mm -hmm. So we have time for a few more questions, a few questions. Can either speak or uh, ask your question in the chat window. I have a quick question if, if uh, the audience doesn't mind. Um, I have a question about the speed of those defects um, that you just mentioned in the uh, latter part of your talk. 
uh, once they are created, yeah. are there models to um, understand how fast they can move and are there ways to measure them? So I understand that the spin ice system is actually realized experimentally. So, uh, or, or did I misunderstand that? <laughs> oh, that's 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 a really good question. So the thing is that uh, the spin ice, the classical version of spin ice is realized experimentally, but now the quantum version. So here the monopoles are not really talking to each other. So they're not really entangled, they're separated. But uh, to really measure the velocity, actually, uh, it's a next step of experiment because <laughs> so uh, because as you can see that we can see the onset of the uh, of the temperature of the of the coherent schedule, but this coherent schedule is actually perpendicular to the this actually uh, the experiment is done perpendicular to the uh, direction of the monopole diffusion, so that we only know that it produced coherent scattering, but we don't know how far it has been moved. So, but experiment can be done that if we probe along the monopole diffusion direction, we will know how far it moved. And with a time scale, we will know like how far it really moved the, the velocity of the effects. So for current experiment result, uh, I cannot really answer this question, but uh, for the next probe of experiment, we'll be able to answer this question, hopefully. And in what te technologies can, you know, as you get a better understanding, where, where can one apply this to existing technologies? Uh, so it's not really like applying it to existing technology, it's really to generate next generation of technology. So we think about this way, um, like our cell phones, our laptop, they're now use chips that are silicon based. And, um, but the knowledge of silicon was actually from the 19, 40s and 1950s, but they really profound this like zero one state that are really highly manipulable. And that is like the current challenge for our solid state physics, uh, for the materials that we're studying now, that they demonstrate some really nice properties, but we don't have a way to really logically control it to make it really perform as well as silicon. But they have the properties that silicon doesn't have, for example, this entanglement process. And so it's really still at the fundamental science and material science uh, stage, um, but it's really shooting for the next generation of device. Great, thank you. Okay, um, if there are no further questions. I think at this point, I'd like to actually turn things over to David Kupperman, the chair of the advisory council. David. Great, well, th thank you for our, our speakers. That was wonderful. And uh, I, I, I'll speak for myself. I, I understood about half, so I, I, it's above my head. My, I, I've forgotten too much of my physics, but uh, it's always good to reconnect and, and see the wonderful things that are being done at, at the department. So thank you again for, for your time and, uh, and, and presenting to us today. And, and for those of you dialing who haven't been uh, involved or in, in contact with the department uh, over, you know, since they've, they've left the university, whether it's, it's grad students, undergrad, postdocs, uh, we'd always love to, to reconnect we, with the, uh, the advisory committee. And we have several members uh, on the call, including Shane, who was asking some of the questions, uh, who are on the advisory committee. And it's, uh, you know, we're always uh, looking to help people reconnect with the department. So please feel free if you do have questions and, you know, how to re-engage with the department to reach out to myself or to Serena or, or to Tim. Uh, we'd love to always get our, our alums uh, involved and, uh, and, and learning about what, what great things the department's doing. 